Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here um, on this beautiful afternoon, or at least it's beautiful here in the Northeast. Um, today's 420, which as some of you or most of you probably know is like a holy grail day in the cannabis community. Um, it's kind of a silly story that I won't really get into right now, but um, you can give it a quick Google if you're interested. Um, it's a really nice time of year to be having this discussion. It's getting warm, seedlings are going into the ground, it's Taurus season. Um, it's like that really nice plushy um, sensory time of year. So um, I'm really happy to be here today and to be talking with all of you. I'm gonna reserve time at the end for questions and answers and we'll try to just get through this, um, hopefully not too quickly, but um, we will have questions and answers at the end. So if you have any questions, you can type it in the chat box and um, I'll try to get to all of them. Uh, usually this is a pretty question heavy seminar. So anyways, um, we'll talk about today cannabis and CBD specifically for anxiety, pain and digestion, but um, we'll get into some other uses as well because there really are so many. Um, okay, so really we've been hearing a lot about cannabis and CBD and hemp and cannabis related things in the past couple of years. And a lot of people are like, why now, right? Like, why is this the time that cannabis is really coming to the forefront of our culture? Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons for this, but one particular reason is because it's really big medicine, right? So I'm an herbalist, um, I'm a clinical herbalist. I uh, have clients and I use a large pharmacopoeia of different herbs. Um, and a lot of herbs work in pretty subtle ways. Like if you've ever taken, you know, a tincture for, you know, sleep or digestion or something like that, um, that's gonna have, it's physiological effects, but it's generally not going to have hugely psychoactive effects, right? But um, cannabis, on the other hand, does. Cannabis is um, really uh, powerful, and especially the way that folks are growing it these days. Um, it's something that uh, is particularly potent. So, um, Cannabis is interesting because I think just broad spectrum, and we'll get into this a little bit more later, is that um, it really gives us the container uh, mentally and uh, psychoactively and physically also to create the opportunity to change. And I think that one of the most important parts of the healing journey um, especially an herbal or a holistic healing journey is um, to have a safe container in which to change and it's to make changes. And cannabis is really not um, a silver bullet. It's not a cure-all. Um, it's not the only thing that we need to do if we want to really engage in this way. Um, but I want to say that, yeah, cannabis is, um, it's, it's a way in which to create space and hold space um, in order for us to take a break from the sort of constant, um, you know, hypervigilance and the um, rate at which we sort of uh, are expected to perform in this modern society. Um, our culture and um, the rate at which we do things and, you know, the toxins we're exposed to and the information overload and, you know, the, the collective trauma really um, leads to largely, you know, these itises, which are inflammation related, pain, um, anxiety, digestive issues, insomnia, and things like this that sort of naturally come up um, with this environment that we've created. So I think cannabis is um, in a lot of ways up for the challenge of um, creating that space 
for us that a lot of times we have trouble creating for ourselves. So I think that that's um, one thing that's quite interesting about this plant. Um, so I wanna talk about cannabis versus CBD um, or hemp. Uh, this was one of the big lessons that we taught in the early days at the Alchemist Kitchen. And now I, I'm pretty sure folks are um, more aware of this, but that cannabis and CBD and hemp, they're all from the cannabis plant. They're all the same plant. They're all cannabis sativa. Um, from cannabis comes three natural subspecies, cannabis sativa of the same name, cannabis indica, and cannabis ruderalis. Um, and usually what folks are familiar with is sativa or indica or um, some sort of hybrid of those two. Ruderalis is usually the wild cannabis. So that grows um, everywhere from uh, East Asia to the Midwestern United States. You can find ruderalis growing in uh, the side of the road in Kansas, interestingly enough. But um, hemp or industrial hemp really and CBD are largely marketing tactics um, It's and, and legal classifications. So hemp or CBD is uh, classified by the government as a plant that's um, no more than 0.3% THC by dry weight volume. So um, this classification was established in 2018. Um, it had existed before a little bit, but it was basically firmed up in the farm bill and um, was uh, basically detailed to include um, CBD products and extracts and other cannabinoids that are non-psychoactive um, and derivatives of hemp. So um, even hemp hemp seed oil, um, hemp cordage, hemp rope, hemp clothing, that's all coming from the cannabis sativa plant. So I just want to um, acknowledge that. And I like to just refer to this plant as cannabis um, rather than making a distinction because they really are the same plant. So um, going forward, when I'm talking about CBD rich strains, I'll say that, um, but largely we'll refer to this as, as cannabis. Um, yeah, so just a little bit more. CBD is an extract actually. So CBD doesn't actually refer to the plant hemp refers at least to the plant, but CBD um, is an extract of, um, CBD is a cannabinoid really. So it's one phytochemical constituent in this plant. Um, and usually CBD is extracted from uh, the cannabis flower. Um, it's like THC. THC is the other really well-known cannabinoid. Um, the cannabinoids are basically the, the plant-based chemicals in uh, this plant. So um, THC interacts with uh, different receptors in the brain than CBD does. There's a little bit of overlap, but THC largely interacts with CB1 receptors in the brain. Um, and this causes more of the psychoactive effects, whereas CBD and certain other cannabinoids that we'll talk about in a bit interact with CB2 receptors, which are primarily found um, in the body. Um, so these receptors um, are interesting. They're part of our endocannabinoid system, which we'll talk about more. Um, and they determine, you know, which cannabinoid interacts with which receptor determines um, the effects. And we also make our own endogenous cannabinoids, which just means cannabinoids that our body produces, which are called 2-AG and anandamide. And basically um, cannabinoids like CBD and THC are mimicking what those chemicals do in our body. Um, so CBD, Two receptors are primarily concentrated in the immune and gastrointestinal systems. And like I said, CB1 receptors are in the brain and then they're sprinkled throughout the body a little bit as well. Um, so I apologize, this looks a little pixelated now that it's on the bigger screen, but the four cannabis varieties really that we see these days are um, cannabis sativa, which is narrow leaf. Um, so 
you can see on the on the far left of the screen, a cannabis sativa leaf tends to be a little pointier, a little narrower. Um, cannabis indica, which is two over, is tends to be more broad leafed. Sometimes you'll refer to these, um, you'll hear these referred to as narrow leaf temp and broad leaf temp. Um, they're just referring to the subspecies of cannabis that um, the hemp was. Um, grown from. Uh, hybrids, which is in the middle of the sativa and the indica are quite common these days. Um, and the hybrids are actually usually bred um, with ruderalis, which is all the way on the right because ruderalis doesn't have a um, very in your face characteristics, but it um, breeds nicely with the sativa or the indica or both. So the hybrids are usually a combo of sativa, indica, and ruderalis some, in some form. So those are the four things that you usually see today. Um, so just a bit about the ethnobotany and the history of medicinal use. Um, though cannabis has exploded in popularity recently, it's actually a very ancient plant. Um, it's a dioecious plant. We use the female flowers typically, um, although for hemp purposes or for CBD purposes or for industrial hemp purposes, so like cloth and things like that, we might use the male plant. Um, in the wild, cannabis is wind pollinated. Um, it grows really tall and bushy. This is due to that fact. Um, it's sort of reaching for the wind and it has all these nice um, like pollens that sort of disperse and they find each other. And so um, the female flowers are, are pollinated um, via wind or synthetically mostly these days. Um, the cannabis root is also medicinally viable. It doesn't contain CBD or THC or actually any cannabinoids, but it does have um, quite potent anti-inflammatory properties and um, certain cultures use it for poultices, which is like a macerated topical application or um, as a tea, which um, usually accompanies something like a cancer protocol. Um, cannabis is indigenous to Eastern Asia and the Middle East. Um, the first recorded use for cannabis, which is certainly not the first human use, but the first written use we have is about 10,000 years ago in Taiwan, um, where it was used for fiber and food and um, actually as um, so fiber in order to decorate, um, different like potteries and things like that. It's, um, quite beautiful. The leaves also, um, cannabis makes really, really good. If anybody's ever used hemp cord or, um, had cannabis clothing, it, um, is quite strong fiber. And, and so, uh, makes sense. The, um, the oldest medicinal uses um, were in an ancient Chinese pharmacopoeia, um, which was written in 2700 BC. And um, it lists cannabis as um, an anesthetic. So for pain, right, which is something we'll talk about today. Um, but it's also in formulas for about 120 different forms of disease, um, including like menstrual orders, menstrual disorders and topical wounds and things and insomnia and things like that. Um, the ancient Egyptians use cannabis to treat glaucoma, which is actually still um, an effective medicine for, for that uh, disorder and um, just sort of inflammation at large. Um, it was mixed with milk. So this is sort of like a precursor to a cannabis oil or something. A lot of the constituents from cannabis are more readily extracted um, from fat rather than water, like a lot of herbs. Um, but again, used as like an anesthetic, a pain medicine, a sleep aid, a digestive aid. Um, and then in the 19th century, so the skips ahead a lot, and there's actually um, lots of articles on the Alchemist Kitchen website if you wanna read more about the history of cannabis and, and more about that. So check that out. I'm not gonna get too bogged down in it, but um, yeah, in the 19th century, 
uh, cannabis was actually really popular in Western medicine. And I guess in between that too, if we're going to talk about the U S um, colonists, early colonial peoples from Europe um, were actually required to grow a certain amount of hemp or cannabis on their land if they were given parcels of land um, by England um, because it was so popular and it was so useful. It could be used as food. It could be used as cordage. It could be used to make the sails of ships. It could be used to make clothes. And so everybody was actually required um, to grow it if they were sort of gifted this parcel of land as um, just sort of a reciprocity act. Um, George Washington grew it, had like several acres. He kept a really detailed journal about growing cannabis um, in many of the sort of like founding colonial folk of yore. Um, and then in the 19th century, um, so this is sort of the point at which uh, modern medicine starts to move away from herbal medicine because herbal medicine is really the traditional medicine. Um, but at the time that we start to see pharmaceuticals, cannabis is really popular. Um, it was a central ingredient in several uh, patented medicines and there were um, 2000 uh, named medicines containing cannabis in circulation in the US and Europe um, in the early 1900s. And those were produced by 300 manufacturers, including like Eli Lilly and a lot of recognizable names um, in the US. And it was also really fashionable for um, the sort of like wealthy echelon of um, the turn of the century to the 1920s to smoke hashish, which is um, a more traditionally European preparation of cannabis. Um, prior to 1937, when um, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed, which banned its production and distribution, which has very um, racist roots. I tend to never use the word marijuana because it was used, um, it was basically, uh, popularized in order to make cannabis seem foreign um, in response to an influx of, yeah, here we go. Um, in response to an influx of uh, Mexican refugees following the Mexican revolution. Um, this is what they called cannabis that they smoked. Um, and this just has a really racist uh, roots. Uh, and um, again, there's a lot more information on this um, for our purposes today. I'm, I'm going to kind of skim over it, but um, I'll just mention too that black and brown people are definitely disproportionately arrested and charged with harsh and really truly outlandish sentences and incarcerations um, due to cannabis. And the fact that um, the cannabis industry today looks uh, the way it does, which is very white and um, mostly affluent folks. Um, that is a huge injustice. And um, if you are somebody who is wanting to use cannabis as a medicine, um, I really ask that uh, you do some research into that. And um, they have some resources on the last slide, but um, the last prisoner project is a great resource um, for helping to free folks who are incarcerated on minor cannabis charges. Um, and yeah, I, I recently wrote an article called The Changing um, CBD Agriculture, I believe was the title of it, but it's on the Alchemist Kitchen Wisdom blog. And um, it goes a lot more in depth about sort of um, the institutional racism that the cannabis industry largely and very uh, flagrantly um, still promotes. So unfortunately that's where we are, but hopefully things are changing. Um, so when I'm talking about cannabis, I'm talking about it from an herbal perspective. Um, I've worked in the cannabis industry in a couple of different facets, but um, in my practice today, I do use it uh, somewhat regularly depending on uh, clients' wants and needs. 
but I think that it's always really important to be in right relationship with any herb or plant that you're working with. So um, what does right relationship mean? It means that you want to use the herb closest to its natural state. Um, obviously, usually there's some processing involved, but um, in terms of cannabis, whole plant extract is always truly always what you want. Um, the more holistic the herbal extract, the more holistically it will address your needs. Um, whole plant extracts, there have been studies done up to literally 300 times more effective than isolates. Um, unfortunately, most of the studies and especially the early studies have used um, CBD isolates, which um, really just don't have the the uh, entourage effect, um, which is the all the other cannabinoids. And we'll talk just briefly about some of the other cannabinoids, but um, it's cannabis doesn't just have CBD and THC. It has a whole host, um, I think it's 112 named cannabinoids um, that we're not even really sure, you know, like what this is doing yet. So, but they're affecting us positively. So, um, that's important. So whole plant extract is always best. Really stay away from the isolates would be my advice. And also sourcing matters a lot. Um, you wanna look for heirloom varieties. You wanna look for organic strains. You wanna kind of stay away from hybridized flower if you are able to, or feminized seeds if you are looking to grow. Um, these are both really genetically modified preparations. Um, so, I tend to stay away from them. Um, it's really hard to find organic seeds and it's really hard to find heirloom varieties, but um, ask around and uh, look it up on the internet. And um, I my email, I believe is on the first slide. So if you um, need resources, I didn't wanna blast them out to the interwebs because they hadn't gotten permission, but um, I can point you in the right direction. Um, and then the second thing that's really important in using cannabis is that you seek individualized assessment. So not just going to your local bud tender and saying like, what strain do you recommend? Or like, what's your favorite? But um, working with somebody who um, understands where your imbalance is coming from and can match you um, with the energetic compatibility of the plant. So somebody who's um, you know, experiencing insomnia or a ton of pain is going to use a really different preparation than somebody who's experiencing really high levels of anxiety and mania and something like that. And that's going to look different to somebody who's experiencing chronic IBS. So um, you want to just have some, some knowledge of like what that looks like and what your energetic assessment is and and things like this so um, rather than going in blindly and sort of doing trial and error i really recommend seeking um, some sort of individualized attention and then three um, you want to use the correct dose and you want to use cannabis in moderation um, i'm assuming most people who are taking this webinar are not taking this webinar to find out the best way to get high um, that's a different webinar, um, which is totally fine too. But if you're looking to use cannabis for medicinal purposes, um, the using the correct dose. So starting low, going slow, um, using it in moderation, you want to just use what you need. Um, you don't want to overuse, especially if you're using it for chronic issues, because folks' tolerances will rise um, over time by and large. Um, so really pay attention to that. You want to find the minimum effective dose. And then four, you want to use the correct form and method of medicinal use. So um, that's quite simple. I mean, are you going to use it as a tincture? Are you going to use it as a capsule? Are you going to combust it? Are you going to inhale it? Are you going to use it topically? Um, and that can really make all the difference as well. Um, so cannabis, um, as I mentioned in the 
previous slide has its own energetics and every herb has its own energetics and its own actions. So cannabis um, over the long term is cooling. So if you are somebody that has a naturally cold energetic makeup, you might not want to use cannabis all day, every day, because that could exacerbate um, some of your cool tendencies, right? And not just you got cold really easily, but um, your energetics in terms of how your body works. So cooling is um, a slow, it's a slow energy, whereas hot is like tends to be a fast energy. So cannabis is cooling and relaxing. If you're somebody who is more of like on the hypo side of things, on the slower metabolism side of things, on um, the colder side of things, then um, cannabis, you'll have to look at sort of the forms and maybe we can do something where we combine cannabis with an herb that balances out that cooling thing. So that's why you really want the individual attention. You know, we can combine cannabis and ginger, cannabis and cayenne or cannabis and cinnamon and have something that's going to balance that out. So it's not exacerbating um, your natural state of imbalance. And we all have natural states of imbalance, but um, so something to keep in mind. Um, its actions are anti-emetic, which means it um, reduces vomiting, antispasmodic, as many folks probably know, it's great for seizures, mus muscle um, tension, muscle spasms, things like that. It's analgesic, um, so it's great for pain, anti-inflammatory, great for bringing down inflammation and modulating inflammation. Um, it can be an appetite suppressant or stimulant depending on the profile of that specific plant or strain. Um, it is anti-cancer and antioxidant, which are sort of in the same realm, but um, cannabis can uh, really help with a uh, healthy cell death or apostasis, which we'll talk about in a moment. And it can be a sedative or it can be a stimulant. So this is a plant with a lot of different forms and um, it can have a lot of different actions. Um, so cannabis is soothing and um, this information on this slide comes to me from um, one of my teachers, Karen Sanders from Blue Otter School of Herbal Medicine um, out in Northern California. So um, her and her wife, um, Sarah Holmes, have been wonderful teachers to me, and they are um, very learned about cannabis and all herbs. But um, cannabis is soothing, so um, it soothes energy, right? So it brings us back from a state of reactivity to a state of um, of removedness sort of. So um, it's helping to smooth the jagged edges. Um, however, if we're using it chronically, it can create more densities. It can aggravate the coldness, right? It can aggravate um, the lack of movement in the body. Um, we don't want to totally distinct, you know, diminish um, that movement and that activity. We want that balance, right? So, um, so yeah, and then under those densities can be really create sort of more intense fracturing. So we don't wanna abuse cannabis. Um, it's fine to use it regularly, but we don't wanna abuse it chronically. Um, if you think of the sort of stereotype of the classic stoner, right? There's like chill, whatever, like, I don't care about that. That's cool, whatever, right? Like there's that persona. Um, but under the surface, um, there tends to be a lot of pent up emotions, anger and frustration that really haven't been processed. And so, like I was saying, um, we wanna use cannabis to create a container in which to heal, but we don't wanna create a bubble around ourselves where we're not dealing with anything and we're not processing anything. We don't wanna use it as a tool of removal from our life, right? Like that can actually be counterintuitive. We wanna create a safe space so we can heal and we can change. It's like that sort of chrysalis um, you know, like butterfly thing, but, um, we also, yeah, we want to not, uh, sort of like wrap ourselves in the safety blanket and not look up and not deal with the things that we need to deal with. Um, cannabis is a ceremonial plant. It's often, or it has traditionally been used 
to open the self up to spiritual advice and guidance. Um, it can release the mind's control of the body, right? Um, we see that with a lot of like the anxiety medicines and, and things like this. Um, and cannabis can really help us to evolve. It can help us move through the tough stuff. Um, it can increase present time and awareness. Um, it can allow exploratory thought and behavior. Um, it can really sort of like create that container again. Um, but chronic use can lead to our boundaries being a little bit too open too. So we can like be in the bubble or we can be like blown wide open. So it depends on how we're using, how we're, how we're relating to this medicine. Um, both my teacher, Karen Sanders and another um, dear teacher, Tammy Sweet, both classify cannabis as being coyote medicine. So it's trickster medicine. Um, it's really like it, it's working with you and then it's working against you. So we want to um, always be in right relationship with it. Um, cannabis also takes away from dream time. If anybody's a chronic cannabis user uses it for insomnia, um, you'll tend to notice that you don't have as many dreams. So we need our dream time also to process information, impression and emotion and things like this. Um, it's indicated specifically for things like muscle spasms, seizures, MS, lupus, Parkinson's, cancer, anxiety, digestive issues, migraines, persistent nausea. Um, it's great for chemo protocols. Um, and then I will just say that it's contraindicated in kidney disorders. They tend to stay away from that. Um, your kidneys have to process out all the tar. So especially for smokers, um, this can tax kidneys. So stay away from in patients who have like nephritis or um, advanced diabetes and, and things like that. And it's not that they can't use it. It's just that um, quite often they shouldn't smoke it. Um, so, and I think that something interesting too with cannabis is that it really um, addresses these chronic sort of not always named illnesses that um, have been dismissed in the past. Um, my teacher, Tammy Sweet, says that cannabis addresses a lot of times women's pro things that have traditionally been women's problems or, um, you know, people with estrogen dominant bodies. So things like migraines, things like um, PMDD and PMS, um, things like uh, infertility issues. We actually have a lot of cannabinoid receptors in the uterus and the reproductive organs. So sometimes um, infertility can go hand in hand with an endocannabinoid deficiency um, and, and things like hysteria or um, being uh, not able to fully process onslaughts of emotions. Um, cannabis can be a really great medicine. And it's interesting because um, we use the female flower. So um, just thinking about that synergy as well. So um, how does cannabis work in the body? The endocannabinoid system or the ECS, um, it's the system for safety and well-being. The endocannabinoid system wasn't discovered until the 90s, which is quite interesting, but it's basically a master system in the body that holds the other systems. So digestive system, nervous system, metabolic system, things like that. Um, the endocannabinoid system is basically a fine tuner. It's going around and it's saying, which system needs support? Is it this system? Is it that system? Um, so we're supplementing with cannabis and CBD um, that can help to rectify an endocannabinoid deficiency. And when you get an endocannabinoid deficiency, basically this happens when we're inflamed for a long time, when we're stressed for a long time, when we are running ragged, basically. We're not nourishing ourselves. We're just depleting our resources. Um, and so in these cases, which is a lot of us, right? So in these cases, um, phytocannabinoid supplementation can help to rectify this, right? Which is great. Um, Long-term, we want to address the root of the chronic inflammation or the chronic um, depletion. We want to get to the root of it so we can combine herbs, we can combine lifestyle changes and things like this. Um, but phytocannabinoids can be a really great stopgap in the middle of that. Um, and again, they work by mimicking anandamide and 2-AG. 
Um, we have cannabinoid receptors all throughout our body and even on the mitochondria of our cells. Um, cannabinoids help to signal healthy cell death or apoptosis, which is um, why cannabis is so helpful in cancer treatment um, because cancer is basically cells not knowing when to die, right? Um, so cannabis can help our cells recognize when it's time to be taken. Um, so, and then a nourished endocannabinoid system, um, is neuroprotective. So phytocannabinoids can be neuroprotective. They can aid in neural plasticity. And so this is why, um, cannabis and cannabinoids are really helpful with things like PTSD, um, there or depression and cognition and learning. It's really helps us to rewire pathways in the brain. Um, it helps us to think about things differently and it helps us to make different connections and it helps actually to protect our neural cells. So um, this is an important medicine for these things. Um, it's great for pain relief, sleep insomnia, um, but really if the reason is a deficient endocannabinoid system, if the reason is something else um, such as hormonal or something like that, um, this can help, but it probably won't uh, sign and seal the deal. Um, you'll need to work with some other um, avenues. And then the endocannabinoid system also prevents um, the amygdala from hijacking our brain and limbic system. Um, so the amygdala is what causes us to worry. It's an important tool for survival. You can thank your ancestors for that and for their literal survival, which is why you're sitting here today. But the amygdala compares everything that happens or could possibly happen to the worst possible thing that can happen. Um, again, it's important, but it's not serving us really, right? So um, cannabis in the endocannabinoid system can override that and allow us to come um, to our heart space and not be so reactive. So it allows more communication basically in the neural pathway between the amygdala and the front cortex, which is the last part of our brain to develop. It's what makes us, um, you know, adults and responsible and um, empathetic and things like that. So it's important. And again, it's just buying us time. It's giving us a little bit of a container to, to go from. Um, okay. So let's talk about methods of medicinal use. Um, this is just a little chart that I made, but um, there's a couple different methods that I recommend for my clients. Um, oral, which is sort of like eating it, swallowing it. So this can be capsule, this can be an edible form. Um, and then this is just tells a little bit about the onset of action, the peak effect, and then the duration. So you want to think about how long um, are you wanting to wait before you get the effects of the cannabis, right? Are you somebody who has chronic pain or chronic digestive inflammation? And you know that an hour after you wake up, you're going to get heartburn. So you take the capsule when you wake up and that's got you set for six hours. And then you take another capsule six hours after that. And that's got you set for the day. Or um, are you somebody who has anxiety and you have breakthrough panic attacks and you need that cannabis to work right away? So, um, so there's oral capsule, which you swallowed. There's oral sublingual, which is an oil or tincture generally under the tongue. Um, that's a lot shorter of an onset. That's about 15 minutes. Um, it you know, the peak effect is quicker and then it's going to last, um, potentially for about the same time or, um, a little bit less if you've got a little bit of that quicker metabolism. Um, and then inhalation, which is smoking, vaping. I am just going to come out and say that I don't recommend dabbing or hash oil. Um, I don't think that that is being in right relationship with the plant. It takes a ton of plant material to make that resin. And um, it's usually very high THC. It's not good for your lungs. You're a lot of times we're not sure about the solvent. Um, dabbing is not a medicinal preparation. So um, 
let's not do that for health issues, um, in, in my opinion. Um, but smoking, vaping, I don't generally recommend this to my clients unless they're already um, using in this way or unless they're having really debilitating um, sudden onset symptoms like anxiety attacks or muscle spasms or something like that. And in which case I'll usually recommend an oral tincture, sublingual oil, um, and then having the smoking or vaping as a backup um, just in case of those breakouts breakthrough symptoms. And then we've also got topical salve and oil, um, balm or cream, which can be great. Um, again, that's just going to be really targeted though. Um, that's great for bruising, swelling, bad knee, um, muscle soreness, things like that. But um, that's going to be pretty targeted. So if it's something that's chronic, we're going to want to do oral plus topical um, to address specific areas. So dosing, we want to start low and go slow. Everyone has their own dose um, and you wanna find the lowest effective dose because tolerance will often rise. Um, the general guidelines are small baseline dosage, two to five milligrams, two to three times daily. Um, so for a six to 10 milligram total daily, uh, that's where I, you really start to see change. Um, so whether it's cannabis or whether it's CBD, and if you, or if you're advising somebody, um, who has never used cannabis and who, um, has never used CBD, I'd suggest start out with CBD, um, see how that goes. And then, um, we can move to on to, uh, adding in THC and things like that. Um, but basically I, have certain clients who do really well with the baseline dosage, about 10 milligrams total daily. Um, you want to maintain the baseline dosage for about seven days. Um, you want to take note of how it's interacting with your body. Where do you feel it? Is it touching the thing that you wanted it to touch? Is it create, you know, what are the symptoms? What are the side effects? How do you feel? Things like this. Um, after about a week, if it's not working out for you. Let's go up two milligrams every couple of days, two to three days, um, until we find the dosage that works best for you. Um, and then once that dosage is touching that thing, once that dosage is really sort of like soothing that symptom, um, then we want to stay there and we can increase it a little bit. And if, you know, if the symptom starts to overcome the dosage. Um, this is just a helpful little chart too. Um, with children, again, I would, in pets, start lower and go slower um, because a lot of times they're not going to be able to effectively convey what they're feeling. Um, but this is just sort of like a, a weight chart um, and with the condition range in mind too, right? So we can kind of disregard the baseline if the person is in severe pain or the person is doing a cancer protocol or something like this. Um, we can jump up a little bit. Um, I typically, and I'll just say, um, start with CBD, especially if the person doesn't use cannabis recreationally and doesn't want any psychoactive effects. Um, but the next step up is going to be a one-to-one -one tincture. So one part CBD to one part THC. And I find that that really rarely has a psychoactive effect because CBD and THC in the natural state of the cannabis plant are pretty well balanced. And they're that way for a reason, they're balancing each other out. So if anybody's ever experimented with super high um, concentration THC preparations and gotten anxious from it or paranoid or anything like that, um, that's often due to a lack of CBD. The CBD is, you know, sort of like the anxiety calming uh, cannabinoid. So the two are sort of meant to be synergistic with each other. Um, but a lot of times the recreational uh, preparations will have either bred that out or extracted out the CBD in order for the user to experience more of a high. Um, okay, so specifically for anxiety, um, let's start with the basic dosing guidelines. Um, oral and sublingual oils, I find, are really sort of the best method personally that I've found. Um, you want to stay away from that high THC 
concentration, as I was saying, that can really exacerbate anxiety, that can exacerbate paranoia. Um, so sticking to um, hemp cannabis or CBD cannabis preparations at first is great. Um, again, like I was saying, we might do a sublingual oil and an inhalation device if the person is having panic attacks or basic functioning is impaired. Um, and then also, I really encourage the use of other herbal allies um, at the same time so we can sort of like build up the nervous system and the adrenal glands, which are often taxed when we're having really bad anxiety. So herbs that are really like feeding those systems because cannabis is feeding those systems in the way that the endocannabinoid system is like maintaining and like sort of balancing everything. But um, we really want to give those, those two sort of specific systems food. So milky oats is really great. Um, ashwagandha, skullcap, passionflower, um, you know, I could go on, but it depends on the person's constitution. Um, and it depends on a whole host of factors, energetics and things like that. So, but we also want to be doing other herbs at the same time, ideally, and we want to be making some lifestyle changes and maybe we want to look at the diet. Um, and we want to look at, um, sort of the psycho-emotional factors as well. Um, but in the meantime, um, this, CBD and uh, inhalation of CBD can be really, really effective. Um, other cannabinoids to look for in preparations, if you're into this kind of thing, um, I don't really worry about like the other named cannabinoids that we see popping up um, too much, but some folks are interested and I get a lot of questions about it. So CBG, um, is an early precursor. So it comes before CBD and THC turn into CBD and THC. Um, so it's early harvested plants will be really high in this compound. And um, if folks are wanting to use a THC preparation, um, strains that are high in CBG are a little bit less likely to cause anxiety. So they can be good for both psychoactivity and um, not so much anxiety hand in hand with that. Um, for pain, oh, ooh, we're running out of time. Okay. I'll speed it up a little bit. Um, for chronic, but not debilitating pain. Um, I usually start with a one-to-one -one preparation again, THC to CBD. Um, the oral sublingual, um, is my preferred method. And you want to start about 10 milligrams, depending on the um, size of the person and the severity of the pain, two to three times a day. For severe pain, um, you want to start at that dose and then work up. Um, you can also do the inhalation for breakthrough pain or to manage it a little bit or to just to experiment. Um, Indicas usually I'd use for um, pain and body aches. Um, and then also if the person is um, in so much pain that they are taking opiates, but would like to stop, um, it's possible to use uh, THC rich preparations of cannabis to titrate away from opiates. Um, THC potentiates opiates by up to 30%. So we can actually use 30% less opiates with the same results um, in severe pain patients. So um, that's really important. Um, that can be really, really helpful, especially as um, addiction is a really big issue for folks who are using opiates and also um, tolerance to opiates rises really quickly. So we can experiment with using higher levels of THC and things like this. Um, I will also say that California poppy is a great herb um, as a stand-in when titrating away from prescription opiates and mitigating pain symptoms. Um, other herbs like kava um, and St. John's wort and um, ghost pipe essence are um, things that I've found really effective. Um, and you always want to work, of course, with a professional herbalist and or doctor um, to titrate away from any prescription drug. Um, 
Other cannabinoids to look out for for pain, um, CBN, it's um, actually like the older form of THC as it breaks down CBN levels will um, increase. CBN has been shown to be good for pain. Um, it can kind of be like more of that couch melty effect, um, but it's um, not as psychoactive as THC, um, might have some mild, psych mild psychoactivity, but um, it's nice for treating like pain that goes with insomnia, pain that goes with anxiety, where you want to get the high THC, but you don't want to exacerbate um, the anxiety or the insomnia. And then CBDA, which comes from the fresh cannabis plant, um, can really sort of mimic uh, and SAIDs, so things like um, ibuprofen. Um, and so CBDA is really interesting. Like it's not a stable cannabinoid because it has to be fresh. And as time goes on, it, it turns um, into CBD and, and THC. Um, but uh, if you can, and I know certain brands have been able to preserve the CBDA as the CBDA. So um, that's an interesting one to look out for too. And I know that it's becoming a little bit more popular. So you might see it um, more in the, in the mainstream, but um, yeah. So CBDA as um, a way to sort of replace the ibuprofen and aspirin supplementation, things like that. Um, for digestion, we want to start with the basic guidelines because um, that's typically uh, typically for digestion, low doses are good. Um, it depends on what type of digestive issues we're looking at. But um, yeah, so digestion, I usually use the capsules or the edibles because you really want um, the CBD or the cannabinoids or the cannabis to get into the stomach. And um, I also like using... Uh, complementary herbs here too, but yes, for, for things like severe pain and nausea and cramping, um, loss of appetite, high THC is recommended, um, but uh, for chronic issues like Crohn's, ulcer ulcerative colitis, IBS, chronic pain and inflammation in the gut, um, I think the one-to-one -one sublingual or one-to-one -one capsules or edibles are recommended. Um, for low grade inflammation, often CBD capsules or sublingual are just fine. And again, we want to do complementary herbs here. Um, powders like gelatin or collagen peptides, if they do animal products, um, we want to do daily infusions with gut healing herbs that are like calendula, raspberry leaf, plantain, burdock, marshmallow, meadowsweet, et cetera. Um, we want to do broths. We want to do dietary changes. Um, and, and yeah, those are other things to look at because um, obviously something is irritating the gut and we don't want to just toss CBD on top of it and call it a day. Um, other cannabinoids for digestion, THCV, which is like THC, but it's less psychoactive again. So it's great for appetite stimulation, but for folks who don't want to feel high. CBDA, again, which we just talked about, is also great for nausea and anxiety. Um, there's one study that said it was a thousand times more powerful than CBD um, for anti-nausea and anti-anxiety, but um, I don't know how much I believe that it's 1,000 times more effective, but it's something to look for um, if you're considering different preparations and one has CBDA and these are the reasons that you want it. Um, just an important last little note, um, cannabis as we talked about with opiates, potentiates pharmaceuticals often. Um, any herb you put in your body will have an effect on any pharmaceutical medication you're taking. Maybe it's noticeable, maybe it's not, maybe it's a problem, maybe it's a good thing. Um, as a rule of thumb, if your medication says that you should avoid grapefruit, um, then you want to avoid supplementing with um, large doses of cannabis regularly, or you want to talk to your doctor and do some more research and consult with a physician, consult with an herbalist, because um, it speeds up the metabolism um, in your liver, basically, which is what processes out all the pharmaceuticals. And um, that can lead to undesirable results if you're on something like 
birth control where you need to maintain a steady thing or you're on um, some other sort of like maybe like a behavioral um, medication. So you want to just um, take care to look at that. Um, in other ways, this could be a good thing, as in with the opiates, you can take less with the same effect. Um, and yeah, just according to a Medicare study um, that I thought was interesting, so a, a non-biased third-party study um, in states where cannabis was legal, opiate addiction-based deaths dropped and number of opiate um, pers <laughs> supposed to be, say prescriptions significantly dropped. Um, and that was directly correlated to the number of medical cannabis prescriptions. And um, I think that this is part of the reason that uh, legalization has dragged on in a lot of states because there's a lot of money in pharmaceuticals, unfortunately. Um, also, just a note, uh, those with a family history of psychosis, especially schizophrenia, should not use high THC preparations unless um, you consult with a counselor and a doctor and things like that. Um, it's not that those folks can't use cannabis. It's just something to be aware of and um, proceed with caution. And then this is just some resources. The Color of Cannabis is a really cool organization that's sort of helping to pave the pathway to um, restorative justice and using um, funds from cannabis to pay reparations and go back into communities. Last pr prisoner project, which focuses on getting folks out of prison who are imprisoned for cannabis related crimes. And then Tammy Sweet, who is one of my teacher and she is a cannabis queen. Um, she is really coming at cannabis from an herbal perspective and has done a lot of really interesting research. Um, she recently put a book out called Holistic Healing Guide to Cannabis. And so that's an interesting resource too. So um, I think that about sums up the talking points that I had. And so if we are gonna look at the chat, it looks like we've got um, some interesting questions. Hi, Carrie. Thanks so much. Um, anybody got a question? So Leah says, I do CBD oil, tea, tree, but cannabis is no good for me. Can I have low intolerance for THC? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, sometimes THC exacerbates uh, either like the way our minds work or the way our bodies work. And um, it's kind of, yeah, it's not good for everybody. Definitely. Um, I know a lot of people also as, um, they get older, move away from THC because it can really, um, alter the way that you think and feel. So yeah, definitely. Um, Judy says if someone were to start to use cannabis medicinally, what would be recommended? Um, to that, I would say it depends on really what you're using it for. So, um, if you were using it for, so again, I think we went over that a little bit after that question was asked, but, um, yeah, so I, I tend to prefer sublingual oils or tinctures, um, but edibles can be great too. Um, again, it just depends on what you're, what you're using it for, how often you're using it, um, and sort of the, the symptoms you're hoping to reconcile with that. Um, Gianna says, I make my own CBD oil and use it two to three times a day for me to focus and to help with sleep. Um, oh, I don't think that that is necessarily too much. Honestly, I, um, I don't think like there is a too much and, and not enough. I mean, yeah, you're using it two to three times a day. That's great. Um, since you make it yourself, maybe we don't know the milligram content. Um, if you're cool with taking it that many times a day and you feel good and, um, and that's working for you, then I think that that's great. Um, CBD oil is anti-inflammatory. Um, and if it's helping you with your mood and focus and it's helping you with your sleep, then that's great. Um, if you're averse to sort of like leveling up the milligrams eventually, if you're finding that it's not proving to be as effective, um, then you can either up the dose or take a break too is another option. Um, we can always take breaks from herbs and then revisit them in a couple of weeks. 
Um, and then uh, Paula asked, how do you measure milligrams when using the inhalation method, weighing the flowers? Um, so that's a really good question, actually. Um, it depends on the inhalation device. Uh, the inhalation devices are gonna be different and the way that people inhale are gonna be different. <clears throat> so um, the, the way that you would measure it is by how much oil you're inhaling or by how much flour you're inhaling. Yeah, so um, with the milligrams, weighing the flowers wouldn't necessarily do it um, because really what you're measuring is the, con the cannabinoid content in the flowers. So you would more have to get the flowers tested and then um, do the weight by volume and then weigh the flowers and then sort of measure how much you've inhaled and combusted. Um, but also again, once you light something on fire, um, you're not inhaling all of it all of the time. So that's one of the trickiest ones to uh, measure in milligrams. So it kind of depends. Um, sorry, I don't have a more specific answer to that. And then what's the difference between sativa and indica? That is, um, that is a good question. Um, there are different subspecies. Typically, sativas are uh, more energizing. Um, they are more conducive to like cognitive function and things like that. Um, so people will say sativas can be more stimulating. Um, for indicas, those tend to be more, so people will say sativa is more of like a mental high um, creativity, energy, things like that. And then indica is more of like a bodily high where um, you uh, would use it more for like pain. It's more of like that couch melty, um, sleepy uh, cannabis. So um, that is uh, generally the the difference and then also actually like there's this thing where like the indicas of today were the sativas of yesterday and so but generally um for your purposes uh sativas tend to be a little more stimulating indicas tend to be a little more relaxing um thanks jb um, besides pain, what are some other benefits for topical applications in a face cream? Yeah, um, topical applications can be great for inflammatory skin stuff. Um, you can definitely use it for face cream. I know that Alchemist Kitchen has a bunch of really nice uh, topical facial products that um, contain CBD. Um, yeah, those are great. Um, you could use, so I've had folks use them for things like um, rosacea, um, broken capillaries, uh, recurring um, poison ivy rash, actually. I had one person do topical applications of that. Um, not an oil-based, it was a water-based cream. Um, but yeah, using an interface cream can be great. It's antioxidant rich. Um, and depending on the other um, ingredients in the cream, it can be really nourishing and, and beautiful. Yeah, definitely. Onset of effects for oil preparations can vary greatly. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, it can definitely, yeah, Martinez um, can definitely, oral preparations can vary greatly also depending on like the food you have in your stomach, the rate of your metabolic um, intake and everything. And then, yeah, um, and I definitely have concerns about lung health with respect to vaping and smoking. Um, yeah, I don't recommend it as the main, um, as the main application, but I, um, you know, I think it, it's worth mentioning that it's helpful for, for breakthrough, um, symptoms. And if a person is already using it in that form, sometimes it can be comfortable for them to continue using it in that form. Um, I'd much rather see somebody smoke than see them vape. That's a personal preference. Um, vaping can create a really dry, hot, um, sort of like environment in the lung. Um, 
and we don't always know the oil. We don't always know the extraction method. Um, humans have been smoking things for many thousands of years. So um, I'd rather uh, see that. Um, but there's definitely some concern there because anytime you're combusting anything and inhaling it, it's not great for your lungs. So we want to move away from that if we can. Um, and then Samuel for daily anxiety or depression, what concentration of CBD tincture would you use? Um, so, uh, yeah, the Alchemist Kitchen, um, makes a really, really great CBD tincture. Um, the, I'm less concerned about how many milligrams are in the bottle. I'm more concerned about how many milligrams you're using. So, um, for daily anxiety, depression, um, if you're new to using CBD, I'd want to visit those, uh, basic guidelines. So, um, let's say starting out about five milligrams twice a day and seeing what that does and then going from there. So you could get a bottle that has a thousand milligrams. You'll only need to take a couple of drops to get that five milligram dose. And that'll last you a really long time. Or you could get a bottle that's 100 milligrams and you're just going to need to take more of the oil. So it's just about um, how many milligrams you're getting per serving and then keeping that pretty regular. So um, you just want to read the label um, on the bottle. Is it just a couple of drops that you're needing to take? Is it a drop or full? Um, and you just want to keep that dose consistent and then see if that's working for you. If that's not working for you, you want to move up a little bit. Um, so Samuel says, how do you know a, a CBD product meets a good quality standard? Is there a quality stamp? That's a really good question. Um, you kind of have to ask around folks have so many different. So I will say that, um, the alchemist kitchen has really, really nice quality whole plant extracts. Um, there's, um, you want to look for the whole plant extract, right? So you want, um, to see that's not an isolate. That's my first recommendation. You want to see that it's a whole plant extract. You want the flower to be organic. Um, you want the oil to be organic if possible. Um, and then, uh, is there a quality, sorry, is there a quality stamp? There is not a quality stamp. And then I, I think that it's like sort of a, a thing of doing our research too. Um, it's, there's so much information, but, um, it's, yeah, it's just, it's hard to, to say like a blanket statement and then folks have, you know, different, um, access to different things. If you're going to a dispensary, they're going to have just like different things. So I hesitate to like make a blanket one, but you want to think about sourcing. You want to look up the brands you buy before you buy them. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that the main things are whole plant and the main things are organic. And that's what I look for. Um, when I'm, when I'm sourcing a CBD product. Um, and regenerative, regenerative agriculture is another sort of buzzword that I, that I look for, um, when I'm, when I'm looking at CBD. So I try to look for brands that are like putting something back into the earth rather than just like taking it. Um, so JB, do you have an, a blog? Um, I don't have a personal blog. I do have a website. Um, it's on the first slide. It's called Quintessence herbs.com that mostly has my, um, herbal products and you can book a consultation with me if you wanted to do that. Um, but I write for the alchemist kitchen blog pretty regularly. So if you search my name, which is Michaela Foley on the alchemist kitchen blog, um, you can read a lot of my articles or if you wanted to email me, um, I'm always happy to correspond that way too. Um, and then my thoughts on Delta eight, um, I don't know that much about it. Um, it's a cannabis compound. I know it's gotten a lot of like press recently. Um, I know it's sort of like Delta, it's like THC, which is Delta nine. Um, but 
it can be extracted from um, CBD and it can be extracted from cannabis. Um, I honestly, I don't feel like I know enough about it and I don't have experience with it. Um, so I am not quite sure what my thoughts are on it, but um, I could definitely look into it and uh, give you uh, my take on it in the future. If you wanted to reach out to me, I'd be happy to do that. Um, yeah. If does anybody have any more questions? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. You've been super great. Thanks for sitting through this on a beautiful evening. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Have a great rest of your week. Um, if you have any questions or any follow up, feel free to reach out. Um, always happy to talk plants and everybody be well and wishing you all the best.